We think women need to talk more openly about money because money really matters. It shouldn't be embarrassing or confusing. Join the conversation. We'll be discussing a whole range of topics which will help you get comfortable with your finances. Money Matters, brought to you by AJ Bell. Hello and welcome to the Money Matters podcast. I'm Danny Hewson and as always, I'm joined by Laura Suter. Hi, Laura. Hi there, and thanks for joining us again. So you know by now that we're very unhappy with the gender investment gap, um, and this podcast is aimed at helping women get to grips with their finances and to have straightforward conversations about it, but also to understand what they should be doing with their money and their investments. For example, the survey that we carried out right at the start of this Money Matters campaign found that a third of women didn't think that they were saving enough for their future. And they know it's a problem. You're listening to this podcast because you want to know more, you want to do more. And we do know that a lack of disposable income is the biggest barrier, but 15% of women we spoke to said they didn't know where to start and 20% said they didn't understand. So we thought we'd dig into that a bit and look at the help that is available out there to people. And in particular, we're going to look at financial advisors and look at how they might be able to help you. So we're going to look at whether that might be the right fit for you, examples of where you might try to seek one. And also, if you do decide to go and get one, how you go about finding one. And then we're also going to look at something called financial coaching, which is a bit different. And we're going to dig into the differences there. Now, we know these options don't work for everyone. Some people might want to do it themselves. Some people might find that circumstances are such that they have to do it themselves. So I've been chatting with Charlene Young, AJ Bell, you invests pension and saving expert about where to start if you're using an investment platform and what the industry can do better to help women on their investment journeys. So as we record this, whether at the start of a new tax year, and that's a great time to look at your finances and really delve into them and organise them. And part of that might be things like looking at whether you have a pension with your employer and where that pot of money is sitting, how it's invested, um, but also looking at any investments you have or getting started with investments and how much money is sitting in your ISA. But a lot of these things can be quite confusing and also quite time consuming. So you might feel like you need some help with it. So I've been chatting to Chanel Pattinson, who is co-founder of Money Means and also a financial advisor at PMP Invest, about what financial advisors actually do and when might be a good time to find one. So lots of people might have never used a financial advisor or even thought about using one. So what can a financial advisor offer someone that they can't necessarily do themselves? Yeah, absolutely. So a lot of people, when they do think of financial advice or financial planning, um, often think straight away of getting recommended products such as ISAs, protections, pensions, stuff like that, um, which definitely does happen. However, there is much more to it. Um, the most amazing and important thing about financial planning is it's actually about the bigger picture. Um, and when you sit down with a financial planner, what we actually talk about is your goals, what you want from life, how you want to live, how we can make that happen, what you need to think about. Um, and then we take other stuff such as understanding your level of risk, um, your time frames, your goals, and put together really a plan that we can then work on together. Um, so obviously the knowledge, the expertise that you get from the financial planner, but also really importantly, the support and the c- accountability. Um, some of the most some of the most important times for clients are situations where there is volatility in the market, there maybe has been a bit of a reduction in value in their investments. And actually for them, the most important thing at that point is to give us a call and say, what's going on? And we tell them it's going to be okay. This is the reason. Just give it a bit of time. We see this happening in the future. And that actually is really, really important to the clients and actually really, really valuable. So a big mixture of those things is actually what makes financial planning so important alongside all the other things such as products and investments as well. And so what's the kind of prompt or point where people generally start to think that they might need a financial advisor or might want to look into it? What are some of the kind of scenarios that might prompt them to think that? Yeah, so it varies. It's often the most 
common situation we see is a big life event. So whether that's um, you're planning, you've decided you're going to plan for retirement, you've been made redundant, you want to start a business, those sorts of things. But also there's situations where actually you've taken your personal finances as far as you can on your own or potentially as far as you want to on your own. You may have sort of dabbled in the investment market and, and had to go and actually thought, I don't really want to do this myself anymore. I want to speak to a financial planner and get them to sort of do it with me together. Um, and also, like I said, the the accountability, maybe you have been doing it yourself, but actually, you know, you would really appreciate that support and accountability from a financial planner. And also the other reasons also, if you just do have really complex finances and, and you need someone to help you with them. And is it the case, I think a lot of people out there who might be kind of newer to investing um, might think that they just don't have enough money to warrant going to a financial advisor. And is that is that definitely the case where you need to have a certain amount in assets or a certain amount in your investment pot or in your pension before um, a financial advisor will deal with you or before it's kind of financially worth paying for someone to help deal with your finances? Yes, so it does vary. There are um, many financial advice, financial planning firms out there that do have a minimum um, and that obviously can make it um, not accessible to everyone that needs it. Um, it does vary. And for example, um, myself, I'm working with a another financial planner to um, build a business called Money Means, which is basically a subscription-based financial planning and money management app. And the reason we're doing that is to be able to make financial planning more accessible um, than it currently is, which is very, very important. Um, to me personally but I would definitely say if you are interested go out and have a look see what's out there um, speak to some people and you'll soon you'll find someone it's the really important thing is to find an advisor or a company that really works for you um, and there is definitely lots of different firms out there and so do you tend to see I guess two points do you tend to see that there's a different reason why women seek out financial advice rather than men and also are they tending to look for a different kind of service to men or are there not really differences there? Um, do you know what, personally, I haven't seen a massive difference in what they're looking for in terms of sort of advice and support. They are definitely similar. Um, I definitely do see myself as a woman, um, more of my clients are women and um, I just naturally do attract them and I do really think it is the whole relatability factor. Um, they just often feel a little bit more relaxed. Um, however, that of course is not always the case. Um, my dad's a financial advisor, many of his clients are women so um it really goes back to that fact I said about finding somebody that you feel really comfortable with and you feel like you can trust and and who works really well with you um but yeah in terms of the advice and support they need it, it generally is quite similar and so when we think about the kind of financial advice industry we do tend to think of it as still quite male dominated a, a large proportion of financial advisors are still male aren't they and I, and I think that is changing as um, more women, younger women come through the system. But do you think sometimes that that could put off some women? I think it definitely makes it, it more difficult. Um, there is still a really large percentage of financial advisors, financial planners who are um, male. However, more women are coming into the industry. Definitely. I've definitely, definitely seen that. Um, and I think so if I look back five years ago at the industry I think I struggled to find that many um, female advisors however when I look now and I speak to my network there is definitely more and more and you definitely can find them if you would rather work with a, a female there's so many amazing female advisors out there they may be a little bit more difficult to find than a male advisor just because of the percentage split but there are so many out there so many amazing ones that you can you can reach out to. And you talked a bit about kind of shopping around almost for a financial advisor and finding one that's the right fit for you. How do you go about doing that? And what are some of the kind of things you should be looking out for? Maybe some of the questions you should be asking? Can you kind of interview a financial advisor before you decide whether you want to work with them? Or is that not really a thing? <laughs> I personally think that's definitely a thing. Um, I always have a initial chat with um, somebody who's potentially looking to be a client or wants some advice, just a really informal chit chat at the start of before we doing anything, sort of 15 minutes. It really is just to get that initial to see if you you sort of get on with each other, see if you feel comfortable, see if you trust them. Because we all know how quickly you can sort of decide whether somebody is is relatable is makes you feel comfortable all of those sorts of things so I think just going out there and 
seeing if you can have a quick initial chat. From what I know, from what I've seen, many, many advisors and planners offer this. And I personally think they should, because even when I have these initial chats, I always say like, look, if you want if you want to shop around go speak to other advisors it's so important that you find somebody that you feel totally comfortable with because with money and with what we do we need to re- you need to really be able to trust us because you need to feel comfortable telling us all your finances and your life goals and so if you don't feel comfortable you don't trust us we can't do the best thing for you so it is so so important so there's some technical terms in the industry that I think a lot of people might not understand. So that's where you can have a restricted advisor or an independent advisor. Um, I think it might be helpful if you could just explain what those mean and if there's one that's maybe better than the other. Yes, absolutely. So the simple explanation is that a independent advisor basically has the whole of market to choose from. So if you go through your conversations and and you get to the point where you decide perhaps you need a pension set up and that the advisor has the whole of the market to choose from, so they could pick any pension provider that they felt was most suitable for you based on all the information you have provided them. Um, Whereas a restricted advisor has a limited selection. So some products will already be crossed off their list. They won't have the option to use them. Um, some advisors have a sort of a panel that they can choose from and some will only have one that they can choose from. So that is basically the difference. Of course, when you do whole of market, you are really getting what is best for you based on everything you have told them. And then I thought it might be useful to cover what kind of financial coaching is or financial counselling. It seems to be something that's quite popular at the moment. How, what is it and how does that differ from financial advice or are they kind of the same thing? Yes, I think that's a really, really important thing to talk about um, because it's definitely financial coaching is being talked about a lot at the moment and it isn't always that clear what the difference is. Um, So uh, financial coaching is guidance um, and it often is generic. So it cannot be personal to you as a client. Um, Whereas financial advice, um, it's regulated. um, There's a lot of compliance and we take a lot of exams. um, And basically everything we do, every recommendation we make that is personal to you, so that can't it can't be personal with coaching every recommendation we make that is personal for you it goes through a lot of compliance a lot of checks to make sure it really is best for you um so it is a very very big differentiator um being able to recommend products based on everything you've told us that we feel for our exams and our compliance is the best possible thing for you whereas coaching is is just guidance So, for example, financial coaching might say it's a good idea to invest your money through an ISA because it's tax efficient, whereas a financial advisor could say, based on your level of income and expenditure, you could save X amount of money into an ISA each year and these are the funds that you should pick. Is that a kind of good example of the difference? Yes, exactly. Um, And with going through an advisor as I mentioned before you go through all of the conversations where we understand everything about you we understand your income your outgoings your level of risk your goals all of these things come together to make a recommendation for you and so I guess the final thing if someone's thinking about um, using a financial advisor is is how how expensive is it how I know obviously that's going to vary a lot different people charge different amounts but um Roughly, how much would it generally cost you? And is that across a year? Is that a monthly cost? How does it work? Um, I suppose the best way to explain it would be um, there are two main types of charging structures, um, one of them being percentage fees of assets under management. So basically, the advisor will take a percentage of the money you're investing, which um, usually is up to around 3%. um, And then they take a percentage every year of your investments to look after it and and see you for a regular review. Um, Often, I'd probably say average is 1% a year, um, and that comes directly from your investments. Um, The other option is fixed fees um, which is normally based on the level of complexity in your situation um, and that can really vary Um, as you can probably imagine from those um, two examples um, they probably can be quite expensive for, for particular people and also when it comes to assets under management and percentages, that is often when a minimum investment amount comes into the picture um, because obviously it then makes it difficult for the advisor to make their money. Um, so what I'll be offering with money means within the business is a subscription based financial planning. So that's quite a new a subscription um, is quite unusual in financial planning. So we're going to we're going to give that a go. 
Excellent. Thank you so much for explaining all of that. I think that's been so helpful. Good. I'm so glad. It's it's one of those things that actually is quite hard to Google and work out. So if I could be helpful, then amazing. Chanel Pattinson talking to Laura. Now, Chanel also hosts a podcast called Her Bright Future, which is well worth checking out. But those kind of services are not right for everyone, Laura. No, some people might feel really confident dealing with their own money and their own investments. And other people might not want to pay out money for a financial advisor or might not be at that kind of asset level where they think that it's worthwhile. But there's lots of ways of getting into investing without having to pay for it. So things like engaging more with your workplace pension is a really good place to start. And of course, there are also lots of platforms where you can start saving into what are called tax wrappers. Uh, Laura was talking about your ISA there. There are also things like lifetime ISAs. Um, You could start your own self-invested personal pension or you could open simply a dealing account, which means that you get to buy shares in publicly listed companies or it may be in something called a fund, which is basically a crafted mix of investments. So you might see names attached to those funds like Adventurous, Global or Responsible. And if you dig into them a bit more, you'll get a detailed description of exactly what is in the fund, what kind of investor they're tailored towards and how they've performed historically, which gives you a really good idea if that might be right for you. But to do all those things, you generally need a platform, like Danny mentioned, and there are lots of those out there, and they all differ in terms of the type of investments that they offer, the way that they charge funds, and the way that they work. And so um, you need to find the one that's right for you. And to find out a little bit more about those platforms what more they need to do to help women invest as well. I caught up with Charlene Young, a pensions and saving expert from AJ Bell, you invest. Charlene, I suppose um, for for a lot of people, financial planning, uh, paying for a financial advisor might not be what they're looking for at the moment or might not be what they're able to afford at the moment. So If it's not right for you and you're just maybe looking at a platform like AJ Bell, what what can people find on there? How easy is it if you want to make a start, you hit a button today, how easy is it? Well, as we said, only regulated advisors can give you a personal recommendation about what's best for you, but there are other resources out there. So the first one I probably mentioned um, before mentioning the investment platform is Money Helper. So that's a service backed by the government Um, and on specific retirement issues, um, people over 50 can actually get information from an organisation called PensionWise, which is part of the Money Helper service. But as we've mentioned, um, for people who are ready to get started on investing and their investment journey from a younger age, investment platforms such as AJ Bell and other providers do have a wealth of articles, resources and calculators out there. Um, so however, however you like to kind of think about what's best for you and do your research, um, there are plenty of different tools and bits of information out there. You might already have um, an investment provider in mind if you have a workplace pension. Um, but the one thing I, I kind of want to say is that as providers, we, we can, um, we should and we do want to get do more to get everyone investing, um, especially women. Um, so the opportunity is really there, as I mentioned, with all eligible employees being auto-enrolled into a workplace pension scheme. Um, but I think we need to do better. Um, and I'm sort of calling on everyone, um, including ourselves, to do that. So kind of across the board, we're all striving to remove jargon and improve the way we communicate and the language we use across financial services. Because the jargon can be really confusing, can't it? And it can also be quite masculine. It can, yeah. I mean, jargon is a turn-off for anybody. And um, as a a pensions professional, I'm probably as guilty of using it as anyone, even though I try my best not to. Um, So jargon, absolutely a no-no for everybody. But as, as you mentioned, some of the common investment phrases could be construed as being quite masculine and and might put women off from investing. So you think about the terms alpha, hunting, hunting returns and bull markets. 
they don't do anything to kind of dispel the myth of investing as a boys club. And, you know, on the flip side, we're also really mindful that we don't want to be patronizing and and dumbing things down um, because that's absolutely not going to work and and empower people either. Just one word which oddly does put people off is the word investing. And yet you were just talking about workplace pension and and I've spoken to women. In fact, we had um, an event, a Money Matters event recently, and I was talking to some women about investing and they had a workplace pension. And until that point, they hadn't thought of it as an investment. They didn't realise that it was probably invested in the stock market. Yes, absolutely. Um, And, you know, all of us will have a bank account and we will hold cash and some of us might have a savings pot of cash. And that as well is is actually, you know, you're choosing to leave that money perhaps in cash. Um, As you mentioned, property um, is also um, an investment. And it's one, it's all about things that are perhaps more familiar to to us, we feel more comfortable with. Um, And as you say, yes, this maybe this word investing does kind of carry these um, these connotations that it's scary or something you don't know about but absolutely we all we all invest every day and some of us probably don't realize yeah because we do property it is it's an investment and and oddly trying to get on the property ladder can often be the first time that people men women actually sort of dip their toe into the world of investment because they want to save for a property and the one thing about that, that we found with women is that they they do like to have something to work towards it's not just about making money it's about making money for something yeah absolutely and if that helps you kind of become comfortable with investing whether it's dipping your toe in or jumping straight in some people as you mentioned have already bought a house um, having a specific goal in mind is definitely a great place to start um, and that falls through from anybody who is doing their own investment research and making their own decisions. But it also helps with the conversations that you have with financial planners and financial advisors. Um, all of these are goals based, whether that's a lifestyle aspiration or a specific financial goal. So to purchase a property or to put money aside for my children's university fees in the future, for example. What what's, was really interesting is that um, in the run-up to International Women's Day, we were asking um, women in particular about their financial role models. And we saw that for women, mums were number one. How important is it for women to have other women as a financial role models and also to have other women in the financial sector? I think it's really important. And I do think we are starting to see um, the ties change on this, particularly representation of women in financial services and young and up and coming financial advisors, um, for instance, um, as we have a great guest on today as well. Um, But I think, you know, to go back to kind of traditional and what might be perceived as slightly old fashioned point of view, women probably are seen as good at budgeting because they're perhaps in charge of all the kind of household matters and maybe children see that from a young age and that then feeds through to those kind of statistics that we found where mothers are far more likely to be um, the financial role model than their fathers and that was across all age groups. Um, And I think, although that might seem a little bit old-fashioned, if we start to see mothers, other family members, female family members and friends invest, that will lead on and almost like a trickle effect Um, And people perhaps feel a bit more empowered to do so themselves. So um, for people my age, as we've talked about, um, getting on the property ladder is a big thing. Um, I do have friends in their 30s who talk to me about pensions. Um, But again, it's all about engaging people. They sort of roll their eyes when I remind them that I work in pensions. But it's all about having someone you perhaps can feel that you identify with who might be in a similar situation to you. Um, And I've seen some really interesting research as well, um, kind of global research, though, looking at Um, millennial women and I say the tide is changing on it um, taking kind of a leading role um, being primarily responsible for investments in their household Um, and I think one of the interesting takeaways was that millennial women agree that investing is for people like me and it was 40% of millennial women on that global research from Accenture so um, that was compared with 28% of women um, I I hate to use this category but 
in what we have referred to in the past as baby boomers in the industry. <laughs> um, so, yeah, representation. I mean, again, um, I'll leave our, our other guests to talk a bit more about this, but it's really important. And I think if you're really delving into what makes people tick in a professional service and you're asking some really deep questions to find out what their goals are, um, whether they are lifestyle goals or specific financial ones, um, people are more comfortable perhaps dealing with someone who looks, sounds, is from a, the same cultural background as them, as well as the same gender. So it's all about, you know, we're all different. That's what makes people so fascinating and interesting. And people who work in professional services love talking to people. Um, we're all different and pe maybe people want something different um, and not the same kind of perceived um, pinstripe male financial advisor. So I'm, I'm really pleased that, um, you know, there, there are lots of movements in financial services, particularly on the advice side and um, you know, promoting the career to women um, and, and young women, and they are coming through, and they have a really good, um, really good voice in the industry. And I've got high hopes for the future. Charlene, it's been lovely to talk to you. Thank you so much for your time. Thanks, Danny. So, what Charlene said about language there is just really interesting because it can be so confusing and off-putting. Um, the amount of jargon in this industry. I know that when I started out in the finance industry, I found the level of acronyms and jargon and terms that I was madly Googling quite off-putting and quite a big barrier to entry. So I think the more that the investment industry and platforms and finance firms can do to stop using that jargon and to explain things in kind of simpler, easier to understand language will help lots of first-time investors. And I have to admit that when I first joined AJ Bell, I did start using some of that jargon because I kind of felt like it was required. And I had to catch myself because, of course, before that, I'd always sort of had this, this jargon alarm and tried to explain to people exactly what things were in really simple terms. Um, but, yeah, it's, it's an easy trap to fall into, but one which we're trying not to on Money Matters. Um, we do want to know if you've got any questions, as always, what kind of topics should we be tackling? Do sign up to our Money Matters newsletter. It'll have information about upcoming episodes, any live events that we've got, also any articles that are coming up or articles that are already written where you can get some information from. You can do that by going to the AJ Bell You Invest Money Matters website. Just Google AJ Bell Money Matters and it should take you there. And we often, uh, for newsletter subscribers, have some special offers or special deals or giveaways that we don't offer out on social media or on the main website or even on the podcast. So it is worth signing up. And also, you can always get in touch with us if you want to, if you have any feedback or comments or questions. Uh, we're at moneymatters at ajbell.co.uk. Or you can follow us on social media to see a lot more of our articles and great facts and figures. And we are AJ Bell Money Matters on Instagram. And finally, leave us a review wherever you listen to your podcast as it helps other people to find us and it makes us feel happy. Thanks for listening. Before you go, please remember this podcast is for educational purposes and the views expressed don't necessarily reflect those of AJ Bell. The podcast isn't telling you whether certain investments are suitable or not. And don't forget that the value of investments can change and you can lose money as well as make it. It's also important to remember that tax rules apply and that the way an investment performed in the past may not be the same as how it behaves in the future. If you want help, go see a qualified financial advisor.